I can see people are people are joining. So um, I yeah, will we've say got eleven. We um, we do have a um, we do have a uh, a chat feature on uh, Zoom, and um, I would encourage everyone to use the chat feature if you want to pose a question or. Um, otherwise, you know, raise your hand and um, uh, uh, you know be be heard from. Um, we are recording this, and so we'll be posting this, of course, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and um, uh, and one thing I found that's good to tell people, Paul, is that in the upper right-hand corner, there's a speaker view versus. Speaker Sorry. big. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Up in the, you said upper in the right hand corner. Sorry. In the upper right hand corner, everyone individually can decide whether they want to see, you know, one speaker at a time or a Hollywood Squares type of view with the gallery view in the upper right. I like Brady. We don't, we don't control the, that's not view. centrally controlled. That's individually controlled. Right. And Jeff, there are, um, there's a raise your hand feature there that you're seeing. I'm not sure if I'm seeing it because I'm the. Well, down at the bottom, there's a chat. Yes. And you can click on that chat and then type a message and it will either, you can select who it goes to. It can either go to everyone in the meeting or just to one person if you want to send it more directly. Okay, right, right. There's also a raise hand feature that you can uh, right nearby it, click it. I just raised my hand just to show that it works. There it is. Okay, that's right. I wasn't seeing that, but thank you, Duncan. So we'll, we'll use raise your hand if you want to pose questions. And then, of course, um, you can chat. What is the link to the YouTube channel? I will share it with you. Oh, and Gary, should I also change share the link to the um, uh, Berryville Institute and uh, the new report? Oh, hold on, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, Gary. Yeah, that no problem. That that would be great. Okay. So uh, the URL is BerryvilleIML.com. And the report I'm talking about is the first thing under results. So if you go to Berryville IML slash results, um, there is a kind of a registration wall. You can lie to it. Or if you really feel like you don't want to type anything at our server, you can send me email and I'll just send you a copy later. Great. Okay. And the only other thing I would say is the raise your hand button is on the participant screen, not on the chat screen. So there's a chat button at the bottom and a participant button. And they're asking what the link to the YouTube channel is. Okay, you got that, Paul. Okay. Yep. And Gary just shared the yep. variable. Great. And people should copy that information down because when the meeting ends, the chat goes away as far as I know. Yeah, I don't the chat I don't think is captured with the video. Right. Mm -hmm. There is uh, three little dots in the, in the bottom of the chat window that if you click on it, it says save the chat. And at the oh. end is if you manage to remember to do it near the end of the meeting, you can save a copy of everything in the chat channel. Oh, cool. All right. Thank you. Hey, Ann Ryan, how you doing? Good Hi, to see you. I'm fine. Good to see you. Welcome back. I didn't hear that last. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're at five past the hour. I think it's a good time to start and um, Gary, can you can you share your screen right now? Because if you can, then I can continue to manage the people drifting into the waiting room. Yeah, you can. Let's there see. you go. Does that look good? That looks good. Great. 
Let me see if I can. And everyone can see that. Yes, yes. I'm trying to look at people. And Paul, you can turn off the waiting room if you want and just let people come right in. Yeah, I'm a little reluctant to do that just because. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we come on. Know, we don't know Let's what happens when you do bomb. that. That's no problem. <laughs> So, Paul, are you going to do an intro thingy? Oh, yeah. Are we ready, are we ready to go? <laughs> hey, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us for our May 2020 uh, Security of Things Meetup. I know it's been a few months since we've done one of these, and um, I was saying to uh, Jeff, I'm not sure why we uh, took so long to do a purely virtual um, uh, meetup, because it's obviously it's a it's, it's, uh, lower barrier to entry and we were getting people from you know Boston area and then outside so my certainly as long as we're quarantined uh, Jeff and I are committed to doing uh, at least one of these a month and we've got uh, we've got some some great uh, uh, folks that we've been talking about bringing in and, and talking to you um, and but uh, as I'm sure all of you agree I am very anxious to get back to meeting in person as soon as we can and do it safely and uh, I, uh, I, I would it. way rather be in Boston tonight too. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd all rather be eating eating pizza and and uh, salad and uh, and seeing each other face to face. So I hope everybody on the line is uh, doing well and and safe and healthy. And uh, thanks everyone for for joining us. We have both um, our Boston Cambridge Security Things Meetup, and I did uh, share the meeting across to our. Um, our New York uh, Security of Things Meetup, which is a smaller group, but I, we may have some, some folks from the Big Apple on the line as well. We had a bunch of people RSVP from there as well. So if you're dialing in from the New York uh, Security Things Meetup, welcome. And um, again, looking forward to doing this again. I'm really, really happy to um, welcome our guest this, this month, who is Gary McGraw, who is a long time um, friend and, and resource for me as a security reporter and somebody who is writing about cybersecurity. Gary literally wrote the book on software security um, as, as well as a number of other topics. Um, he um, has a long history in cybersecurity, uh, founded the company or co-founded the company Sigital um, and uh, develop before his current work with a Berryville Institute of Machine Learning, um, really pioneered a incredibly important um, uh, assessment tool called BSIM, uh, the Building Security and Maturity Model, which is really um, the kind of standard metric for measuring application security across platforms and so on. And, um, and that was uh, just an incredibly important development. And um, more recently, um, first of all, Gary's been a, a big supporter of uh, secure repairs and right to repair and, and has testified for us um, uh, talking about, um, you know, the importance of repair and also kind of defudifying some of the cybersecurity arguments that, that OEMs make around uh, repair and cybersecurity. But uh, the, mo the really interesting thing he's, he's done is to sort of come out of retirement and focus his energies and attention on what I think is an incredibly important area, which is um, cyber risk and machine learning. Um, and uh, he founded a kind of think tank, I guess, Gary, is that a fair way to describe Barryville? <laughs> sure, yeah. Research group, <laughs> think, think tank. Think tank, something like that. <laughs> run out of his kitchen, more or less, called the Barryville yeah. Institute of Machine Learning, and they have just come out with their first uh, kind of comprehensive report um, uh, cyber risk assessment of machine learning uh, technologies and Gary's here to talk to you about that and about kind of how this all got started and I think a, a broader conversation just about machine learning and cyber risk. So Gary, uh, welcome to Security Things uh, Meetup and thank you so much for joining us and tell us where you're joining us from. I am calling from Virginia um, and I am very bad at retirement. I sort of do three things these days. I play my violin and I have huge bonfires on the solstice where lots of people come. I'm not sure how we're going to do that with social distancing. And sometimes I have a lightsaber. <clears throat> so if you're, uh, if you're following along, I would encourage you to live tweet this thing. My um, Twitter handle is at Sigital Gem. 
C I G I T A L G E M. And, uh, and I want to talk about securing machine learning. This is kind of interesting. A lot of people that come to security and think about machine learning are trying to use machine learning to do security. And, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about. Instead, I'm interested in how do we secure the mechanisms of machine learning themselves. So you can think of it as building security in for machine learning. And this work is really meant to be useful for both security people who all of a sudden have a pile of machine learning stuff they have to secure and also engineers and implementers of machine learning uh, systems themselves. So um, I'm, I'm calling, I'm, I'm talking from Virginia and there's this tiny little speck of a town down here called Berryville that has more cows than people. And so we call our institute the Berryville Institute because we thought if Santa Fe can have an institute, we can have an institute too. Um, and we, and we uh, refer to it as BIML. This is one of our many silly logos. The best part about this cow is that middle splotch right there in the cow is actually the shape of Clark County. <laughs> I think we may be the only high tech thing going on in this county. I thought that so was I thought a good looking splotch for a cow, Gary. I'm glad you explained to me what that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My daughter Jackie put that splotch on there. I thought it was great. So um, I thought I would start by giving a quick introduction to machine learning. I actually have a PhD in cognitive science and computer science, and I studied with Doug Hofstetter, um, where I wrote a program called Letter Spirit. So I did a bunch of AI and machine learning stuff in cognitive science when I was a grad student. And one of the things that interested me in all this after retirement was, hey, what's actually going on in machine learning? What's happened in the last 25 years? And have we really made a lot of progress? Or is this kind of um, the, the hype just, you know, what, what's real here? And of course, I'll, I'll cut directly to the chase and tell you what we found out is computers are way faster, data sets are way bigger, and really a lot of the technology is very much the same um, as it's always been. So I thought I would just run through a quick kind of comparison between artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning. And I totally stole this from Melanie Mitchell, who wrote this fantastic book called AI, A Guide for Thinking Humans that I recommend that everybody read. But she had these great slides. And so back in the 50s to the 80s, you know, AI was this big blue thing and machine learning was a little subsection of AI and deep learning to the extent that there was any was a tiny little red square and that really changed in the 1990s machine learning got bigger including things like um, statistical kinds of machine learning and genetic algorithms and stuff like that deep learning was getting a little bit bigger but then something happened in you know around recently in the last 10 years uh, when people say AI or machine learning, they really turn out to be talking about deep learning. And so, you know, it's kind of a confusion of terms out there, um, but there's a lot more to AI than just machine learning. And there's a lot more to machine learning than just deep learning. But uh, deep learning is the focus of most of the hype and most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about how the brain works, you think about a visual system in a brain, you know, you've got all these gajillions of, uh, of neurons and they're all connected together in a big giant network and sort of it flows from in your eyeball through your visual cortex and, you know, you build up edges and simple shapes and complex shapes and faces and eventually you recognize objects. And a convolutional neural network kind of does the same thing. So some input comes in as a bunch of pixels, it goes through a bunch of layers, that do things like edges and simple shapes sort of, and they have activation maps. And ultimately uh, there's a classification module that says, oh, that's mostly doggish, so we'll call it a dog. Um, and that's how feed forward um, deep networks work. In order to do our work, we didn't wanna focus on one particular machine learning model. We thought that we would genericize machine learning um, and think about the risks that are associated with different components in a machine learning model. And so we built this 
model right here in purple to think about the risks in every component. And we identified nine basic components. You can see them here. The processes themselves are ovals and collections of stuff out there in the world or collections that you build out of that stuff are rectangles and arrows represent information. So stuff comes in raw data in the world and it flows up to data set assembly and the data sets turn out to be training and validation and testing sets and so on. The reason that we did this is because we thought that it would be fruitful to think about each one of these components and think about risks in each of these components. And so that's what we did um, for the results I'm gonna share later. We also spent some time thinking about attacks and really frankly, most of the, um, of the press and most of the coverage about machine learning has been about attacks. And in fact, it reminds me a lot of software security in the early days where, you know, there would be attack of the day, somebody would break this piece of software and it would get into the Wall Street Journal. I was doing that with Java with the guys from Princeton. Um, and, you know, there would be discussion about the particular attack, but really nobody ended up talking much about what we ought to do about it, um, which is why I started thinking about software security back in 2000. And frankly, I think that the way we're approaching machine learning security today is very much myopically focused, over-focused on attacks. Um, nevertheless, attacks are an important category of thing to think about when you're doing um, security. And my little logo that has the yin yang with the hats thing has a black hat on purpose. You know, I've, I've done a lot of work on attacking systems and exploiting systems over the years. And so the first thing that we did when we approached this work was think about a very simple taxonomy for all of these attacks. And you can see that we came up with six um, kind of globs of attacks. Uh, one category of attacks is manipulation attacks. Another category is extraction attacks. And um, you can see that we have data manipulation where you're poisoning data or publishing bogus data so that people put that into their model. Uh, input manipulation, where we have things like adversarial examples, which I'll spend some time talking about in a minute. That's probably the most uh, easy, easy to understand and most kind of uh, discussed machine learning attack. We have model manipulation by backdooring. We have uh, on the extraction side, inference attacks or model inversion, where we can pull the data out of the model, extract data of the training corpus, which may be confidential data or model inversion where we're trying to take the entire model and model the model so that we can steal intellectual property, for example, or um, open the box like copying behavior or parameters exactly. So these are kinds of kind of six ways of thinking about attacks. And when we started thinking about that, we said, well, this is good for figuring out attacks, but it's not so good about getting to risks. And we really wanted to get to the risk idea here. Um, first, I'll give you one example of input manipulation. This is kind of, this is adversarial examples that I was talking about before. If you train up a network to say recognize school buses, like the school bus on the left of this little matrix up here, and then you overlay it with kind of crazy looking noise, uh, you get a picture that a human would still say, well, that's a school bus. The one on the right is actually the school bus with the mask over it. Um, but if you show the school bus with the mask over it to a machine learning algorithm that's learned to recognize school buses, it'll say it's an ostrich. And it'll say that this is an ostrich and the building is an ostrich. Everything is an ostrich. They're all ostriches. And the mask is causing the machine learning program to do something wrong um, in a way that a human would never really do. I mean, this has a lot to do with the way machine learning algorithms are trained and the way gradients work and the way um, how, how close in input representation certain things are. Um, and it kind of shows you that machine learning systems, though people say that understands what school buses are, don't do things the way humans do them. They do them uh, very, very differently. So that's an example of input manipulation. Another famous example of, a, of an adversarial example 
is this stop sign where at the University of Michigan, they put some tape on a stop sign. And if you put tape just right, you can confuse a machine learning um, algorithm into thinking that a stop sign is a speed limit sign or a keep right sign. Um, and so, you know, you can think about obvious ways that this would be a problem in the world if you're using machine learning to recognize stop signs in your Tesla and it recognizes the stop sign as a speed limit 45 sign, you can see that that could lead to some problems. So those are some examples of attacks. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time on attacks today. I wanna to spend more time on risks. And so, you know, what we thought we would do is take our nine components that I introduced before and think about each of those individually and try to recognize risks that are kind of inherent in that component. The number one thing, obviously, that is the most important risk and the most important thing to think about in machine learning is data. And that's kind of weird because, you know, the mechanisms that we use in most of computer programs, the technical things that we build are way more important than the data. Although we can overflow buffers, for example. Um, but the processing is what we make go awry. And strangely, in a machine learning algorithm, because we're learning about a bunch of data, the data play an absolutely essential role in security um, and in privacy and in confidentiality and in ethical behavior and all of these things. In fact, I think if you think about risk and machine learning systems, my view is that about 60% of the risk is uh, accountable to data and not to actually the machine itself, but really the data that you use to train the machine. So it's the most important aspect of machine learning security. And if you're getting raw data out there in the world and you're using those raw data to train your machine learning algorithm, you can obviously have some problems. Like if the attacker, if an attacker can control those data out there in the world and you use them to train your machine, your machine is gonna be highly susceptible to attacks. And in fact, you know, we identified 13 risks in this raw data in the world. You can see that up there. Uh, and I'll tell you two of them really quickly. The first is obviously data confidentiality. If you train up a machine learning system on confidential data, like who is sick because of certain medical symptoms, say, um, those data are gonna be built right into the model. And so attacks to extract sensitive data or, you know, privacy concerns that restrict access to confidential data are all going to have really weird impacts on machine learning security. If you think about GDPR, for example, here's a question. I don't know the answer to this question. If you train up a machine learning model on a whole bunch of private data, is the model now susceptible to G GDPR concern? I don't know, nobody's really gotten to that yet, but probably chances are, yeah, because the data's in there represented somehow. So that's one example of a risk. Another example of a risk that we identified in the first component are, is trustworthiness. You know, if the data sources are not trustworthy or suitable or reliable, how might an attacker tamper with some raw input data out there in the world? And what happens if input drifts or changes or disappears? you know, to a machine learning model that was based on those data. So that's kind of two examples of risks associated with component one. Um, and there are 11 more of those that are in the paper that you can check out. Uh, let's see, I click on, there you go. So the second component takes those raw data and transforms them into formats that the machine learning algorithm can understand. Um, this is actually a sneaky trick about machine learning. It turns out that humans do an awful lot of massaging and mungification and screwing around and making it sort of like this so it works. And a lot of engineering kind of kludges go into this notion of making the data good enough for the machine learning system to actually work. Uh, and that's sort of something that gets kind of slipped under the rugs. But uh, pre-processing is always critical. And we have kind of two 
versions of data set assembly that we have to pay attention to. One kind of model is online. It's always getting data and it's always being trained. It never stops being trained. Uh, a more common model is an offline model, which you train up and then you put the model there that's already trained and it doesn't learn anymore. It just processes new data, but it's not learning from those data. Online models are obviously way more complicated um, and have more risk than offline models. But those are two types of models that we can both handle with our generic model here. Um, some examples of risks that are found in data set assembly are encoding integrity, where you can uh, introduce and exacerbate problems in pre-processing. So does the pre-processing step introduce security problems? Is there bias in the raw data processing that can impact ethical or moral implications? For example, uh, let me give you an example. If you take um, all of a bank's data about loans that were given over the past, say, 20 years, and you use that to train up your machine learning model, what if it turns out that the bank was filled with sexist people who only gave loans to white guys? Well, your machine learning system's going to say, oh, that's not a white guy, can't give him a loan, but it won't explain itself. It'll just be a racist. So that's an example of an uh, encoding issue. Um, there's also annotation issues, another risk. So if you think about tagging and bagging data or annotating data into features, that can be directly attacked, introducing attacker bias into a system. So a machine learning system that's trained up on examples that are way too specific, won't be able to generalize, uh, and a whole lot of engineering time goes into machine learning systems that are cleaning up, deleting, aggregating, organizing, and just all out manipulating the data so that it works in an ML uh, situation. And really nobody talks about that. It just sort of, yeah, it just sort of, it works, it, it works. And Gary, so with, that's, the, uh, with the online model, I think about, I think it was the Microsoft uh, chat bot, is that right? Yeah, we're gonna get to Tay in a minute. I'll tell you about, right. about that. There are a lot of risks that that's represented to, to uh, yeah. So there's eight other data set assembly risks. That's just two of them out of the eight. Um, then the third component is data sets themselves. Data sets are grouped into training set, which you use to train the algorithm, a validation set to make sure your training is good enough, and then a test set to see how well your machine learning system is gonna is performing. Those are tricky ways. You know, partitioning those things is very tricky and it deeply impacts future behavior. If you get your training set wrong, obviously your machine learning thing will do the wrong thing. If you don't validate it right or your test sets are incorrect, um, you may have areas where the performance is better than other areas and you don't really understand why because um, you haven't probed it properly. There are two pretty simple examples of data uh, set risks that I, will, that I will mention here. The first is poisoning. So all of the first three components in our generic model, raw data in the world and data set assembly and the data sets themselves are um, subject to poisoning attacks where an attacker intentionally manipulates data in any or all three of the first components, possibly in a coordinated way to cause the machine learning system to do the wrong thing. Uh, here's Tay. So Tay is a perfect example of this. Tay was a Twitter bot that Microsoft wrote and they put it out on Twitter and it was supposed to learn to do Twitter <laughs> the way people do. And it learned to become kind of an awful troll. And it was just like a horrible thing. It was so bad, it learned to behave as badly as people behave on Twitter, which is pretty bad. So they had to turn it off. So Tay got turned off because it learned to be a troll and it was a really good troll. Um, another example is a transfer attack. This is kind of interesting and really applies mostly only to machine learning. Many machine learning systems are constructed by taking an already trained base model that say trained to recognize circles versus squares as a ridiculous example that's somewhat generic and then later you take that model and you fine tune it to do something special like recognize red balls not just balls versus squares so um, the specialized training does uh 
takes the base model and, and makes it do some more stuff. And a transfer attack presents an important kind of risk in this situation where the pre-trained -train, model may have something in it like a backdoor or a Trojan horse that gets carried over and Trojans may be inserted. And uh, there are a bunch of papers on this. There's a bad nets paper that's great. I'll give you the reference in a minute. So there are five more of these risks in the paper. You can see that each one of these components actually has a set of risks associated with it. Um, the learning algorithm itself is the technical heart of machine learning, but it has way less security risk than the data, which, as I said before, I think is the most important thing. Uh, an example of uh, a risk, though, here to the learning algorithm is an online learning system that continues to learn and adjust its behavior during operation, and a clever attack can just nudge the thing in the right direction and get it to be wrong over time. Or there might be a loop uh, inside of a system like this. The Google Translator was once um, learning by reading its own translations that it made before and put out, got put out there on the web. And then it was using those to train itself, so it got tangled up in a horrible loop. <laughs> and that's an example of that online problem. Uh, let's go on to component number five. Evaluation is very tricky. You don't really know when training is done. Like, how good is the train model? And when are you supposed to stop? And is that enough or is that too much? And in fact, you can train a machine learning model to be kind of like a lookup table. It just overfits the data. And they're very, very powerful models. You know, we have thousands and maybe millions of degrees of freedom. And so if you just have the machine memorize the data, it's not really going to generalize and do the thing that you want it to do. It'll just build a big lookup table. That's overfitting. Uh, and then bad evaluation data can lead to all sorts of other kind of problems. Those are two examples of the seven that we identified in evaluation. So I hope by now you're getting a feeling for the kind of risks that we've identified. And ultimately, we identified 78 of those risks. Um, when it comes to input, we talked about adversarial examples. And this is where an adversarial example risk would be put um, in this component. And when it comes to the model itself that's already been trained up, the risks associated with a fielded model are very similar to evaluation risk. but you know, one that's really clear is that you build a machine learning system that's pretty good at doing something, and then you use it for something else. <laughs> and you guys know as well as I know that that happens all the time in computer science, where you're like, well, this kind of works for this, we'll just make it like that or whatever. You know, people like to use their shoe as a hammer, and people use their shoe as a hammer in machine learning too. Uh, and then another example is Trojan models, where you have some sneaky behavior that you train into the model and then you get other people to use your model but they don't know about the sneaky bit that you included in there. This is actually a known attack that are there are examples of in the literature. We have uh, the inference algorithm itself. Um, here's where once again a fielded model operating in an online fashion can be pushed past its boundaries or here's a really important risk. It turns out that machine learning systems do cool stuff. But when you ask the people that build them, why does it do that? How does it do that? They often go, I don't know. It just does. We trained it up, and it got pretty good. And we understand the math, but we don't understand its representation or exactly why it does what it does. It just does it. And you can look at the behavior of these models, and you can go, OK, it mostly does the right thing. But when somebody says, well, how does it do that? You go, I don't know. And inscrutability, that's a real problem. Because if you put out a fielded model without really understanding how it works or why it does what it does, and then you just integrate that into a bigger system, all of a sudden, you got all sorts of crazy black box stuff, voodoo magic that nobody really understands. So that's an example of an inference algorithm risk. There are five of those. And then uh, the next to last category are output risks. Pretty obvious, but system outputs the whole point. You know, you want the machine learning algorithm to do something. So if you directly attack the output, uh, it's pretty obvious. You know, you can just sort of interpose between the output and the world 
do uh, attack or in the middle attack. Um, and since machine learning algorithms are inscrutable, it's pretty easy to get away with some of these things. You can just say, oh, I don't know, it's machine learning. I don't know why it does, it only gives loans to me. I, you know, who knows? Maybe I'm great. Um, and another thing is that, you know, machine learning systems really need to be trustworthy to be put into use. And even a temporary or a partial attack against output can just cause trustworthiness to plummet um, catastrophically. So there are seven of these risks, five more of the, the, the two that I just told you. And finally, there's some system-wide risks that don't fit into the, any of those components. Either they involve two components or they involve the whole system as a whole getting beyond or up and over the component view, we identified 10 risks. And these risks happens between or across components. So one is black box discrimination where many data related component risks lead to bias in the behavior of a machine learning system. And ML systems that operate say on personal data or feed into high impact decision processes like credit rating, credit scoring, employment, whether you should get a job, whether you have cancer, you know, all these things pose a great deal of risk because if the biases are aligned with gender or race or age or up, you know, the system may end up being a discriminatory system and we don't really know why. It's just a black box um, xenophobe or sexist or whatever. And that's a, that's a real issue. Um, and then there's overconfidence. You know, when an ML system actually does some stuff uh, and you put it into a bigger system, users of the system may be overconfident that the thing is going to be great because it's magic ML. It's like, oh, but the ML does the thing. So, of course, it's going to be right. Even if it's obviously doing something wrong, people will say, oh, you know, it must know something we don't know, which is really kind of worrisome, especially given the world that we live in, which, you know, science who cares? So that is a fly overview of the risks that we found in the nine components of our generic machine learning model plus system level risks. And we wrote about each of those 78 risks in a report that you can read. And, you know, the guys at Microsoft have read it and Google and the Facebook people and OpenAI, the, the amount of influence that that work has already had is really very heartening. It's nice to do kind of good architecture risk analysis and see the field go, wow, we love that stuff. So I thought what I would do um, for the next couple minutes is just tell you that my view of the top five out of those 78 risks, and then we'll just call it a day. Um, is that cool? Does that sound good, Paul? Yeah, except that people want to ask you questions. Okay, they can do that in a minute. <laughs> so so uh, I'll, I'll do this really fast. Number one, adversarial examples. We talked about that already. You fool an ML system by providing malicious input. Often tiny little perturbations can cause the system to make false categorizations. So remember, all of those things in the right column, ostrich, ostrich, ostrich. <laughs> and so there's a lot of attention paid to adversarial examples. In fact, people talk about deep fakes and adversarial examples all the time. And there are literally 77 other machine learning risks, but it is number one and it does get a lot of attention. It's taking all the oxygen out of the room. So at least we talked about it. Uh, the second risk is data poisoning. I told you that data probably account for 60% of uh, the, the security of an email system, maybe even more. And if an attacker can intentionally screw around with data in a coordinated way, they can compromise the entire system. Data poisoning attacks require really special attention. It's not something that operation security people are used to thinking about. What fraction of the training data can an attacker control? And to what extent can they control them? How many of our sensors are getting screwed with? What if we blind that thing with a laser? You know, these are things that machine learning people, they don't think about. Us security people, we're thinking about that all the time. And so this thing, when you bring them together, it gets really interesting. Uh, the third online system manipulation, we talked about Tay. Uh, when a system is learning online, it continues to learn and a clever attacker can move it in the right direction and you can retrain it to do the wrong thing. It's a very complicated risk, demanding that email engineers consider both data providence and algorithm choice and systems operation. All of those things combined are the only way to really control online system manipulation. 
transfer learning. This is the one where you train up a base model and then you take its little brain and you put it over there and you, you, tr you train it up to do something more specialized. This is a, a very common thing that happens in machine learning all the time. And in fact, many of the archives and repositories where machine learning stuff lives are not very well secured. And in, there aren't even hashes that are properly assigned with, with code globs. So people just grab a model in all of its trained up glory and they just take it. And you know, God knows what's in that model. There's very little kind of supply chain goodness yet. The people in machine learning, bless their souls, are all very trusting. <laughs> and you know, those of us that have been do doing security for 25 years, not so much. We're like, where did you get that? Why'd you run that? Who wrote that? What else does it do? Uh, we think about that and other people don't. And then of course, confidentiality is a big issue. Data protection is really hard as we all know as security professionals. And when you throw machine learning into the mix, you get even more complexity. Um, one unique challenge is that, you know, you're trying to protect sensitive or confidential data that are represented in a way that you don't understand in the in all of those neurons in, in a deep learning network and you're just like you can't really see somebody's password but it's in there somewhere or you can't see the fact that they're hiv positive but it's in there somewhere so there are many subtle but effective ex extraction attacks against both the data and the system itself and and data confidentiality is like risk number five. So those are the top five um, of all of the risks that we identified in our, our report and the 78 risks that we talked about. Here are some pointers for more. That is my website right there. I put in the Bimble thing in the chat. Um, and like I said, there is a registration wall, which you can lie to. You can tell it whatever you want. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable telling my server anything, you're welcome to send me some email and I will send anybody a copy of the report just because you asked. Um, so now if you wanna do some questions, we can do it. That is my <clears throat> quick talk. Uh, that was great, Gary. And yes, I, I'm guessing there are people do wanna ask questions and I know I've got a couple. So use the, you can either use the chat or raise your hand. There's a raise your hand um, feature just over, if you look at the participants window, um, you can click next to your name and, and uh, raise your hand if you've got a question, and I will relay that to Gary. Um, so we've got one from Duncan, um, Gary, to start, and that mm -hmm. is, um, and, and if you raise your hand, I can also unmute you if you want to just ask him or, or engage with Gary yourself. But uh, Duncan's asking, how many of the 78 risks have been seen in the field or used for malicious purposes? Well, remember, Duncan, the risks are not attacks. Um, and often an attack will leverage two or three risks to make a particular attack against a given system. Um, so that's a little bit tricky to answer. But in the case of, say, adversarial examples, there are some pretty well-known attacks that have been seen, at least in the literature. Now, in the wild, uh, I'm not sure if there have been any real attacks that, I, that I'm, you know, I, I, I haven't been collecting those. Um, I did do uh, the first part of the talk on the attack categories so that we could get a feeling about what the attack space looked like. And we've been doing all that we can to simplify stuff here at BIML. Um, if you read the NIST report on um, attacks in machine learning systems, what they call adversarial machine learning, I hate that terminology, but that's what they call it. Um, you'll find that they have like hundreds of categories of attacks and they're kind of equivocating attacks and risks, which is a little bit iffy for me. So I'd, I'd rather think about the risks as kind of standalone things that we want to handle by themselves without reference to particular attacks. I hope that answers your question. Well, it, it did, but the part of it on the, you know, are people really attacking ML in real life and making money or hurting people or whatever was, was the question. It sounds like yeah. not that much yet. Not that much yet. Not that we know of. And of course, you know, what we're going to do is we'll paint ourselves into the corner and then people will start doing it. <laughs> and then we'll be like, damn, I wish we'd built security in back then. 
Um, Gary Ken asks, um, can you describe solutions? And I think this is a great question. Can you de describe solutions to the inscrutability problem? Because that would seem to be, um, yeah. I know it's just one category of um, risk, but it would seem to me to be the kind of elephant in the living room, as it were. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And actually, inscrutability is a problem in a lot of science, not just machine learning. Um, and a way to get towards a solution is to be very open about your model so you publish your code and about your data so you publish your data and you curate your data in the same way that you curate code so that people know what you did and they can try to do it themselves you know you want to have replication and be a real thing in science and the same thing goes for machine learning now there are some people that have been thinking about that in machine learning land in the literature but not enough. And there are some people that have been thinking about that in say other aspects of science, biology, medicine, um, but not enough. And we need to pay more attention to the inscrutability problem. The, you know, the, the problem with us monkeys, us humans is we just love magic. <laughs> and we, we love to say, Ooh, well, then it's magic and it does the thing and it just kind of works. So everybody should use it. And you know, the it gets even worse when you're talking about magic and high technology, in my view. Um, so a lot of people that don't understand a model will pretend they understand it and then you know they'll take advantage of the inscrutability to do unethical things. And we have to be on the lookout for that. Great question. Um, I, I, uh, so, uh, just reminded of the participants, if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand in the participants window or you can um, just uh, sling it to me via chat. Happy to, um, you, happy to have you unmute and ask Gary yourself or, or use me as a medium. I don't, I don't uh, particularly care. Um, Gary, um, it, it's, it, what's really interesting about this is that, I mean, obviously your background, you started in software security and application security, which is, mm -hmm. You know the the challenge here, of course, is changing developer behaviors to kind of build security <laughs> in right, and getting them to think yeah. just from a um, from a kind of craft uh, perspective on just you know we know how to design yeah. secure software, we just got to get developers to use it. But these problems seem actually much more complex because it it seems to me like yeah one of the things you need to do is first of all agree on like what. <laughs> what the values or we want to like inculcate into machine learning yeah. to begin with. Like, well, we, yeah. we want to use machine learning to do these things. We definitely don't want it to do these things. That's excellent. I can give you an example that came out today. Um, there is some little university where they published yet another machine learning model that's supposed to do facial, re facial recognition on people and determine whether you're a criminal honest to God. These people made this fucking thing and they put it out in the world and all of us are going, don't do that. That's wrong. That's incorrect. It's not going to work. It's going to be a horrible thing. Right. Don't release right. that. Don't talk about that. This is the fifth time this has happened. Is anybody learning? Right. And so, you know, the propensity to do the wrong thing, um, even if you're well-meaning, like they're, well, we don't want criminals, you know, is, is unfortunately a, a really big attractor. Yeah. So we have to be vigilant to, you know, and, and on the lookout for that <laughs> stuff. And the inscrutability issue that we discussed a little bit um, definitely plays into that because, you know, the thing is not going to be sexist or racist in a way that it's, you know, throwing around the N-word or, or, you know, doing stuff that the president does, but, but it, but it will still be, you know, a racist thing right, right. Um, by its behavior. Right. And that kind of inherent insidious racism may be worse than in your face racism because right. you can't, everybody can't say that's bad. No, no, no. So kind of having our collective approach to being right, to being moral and ethical doesn't work so well when you're pointing at a machine. Well, I think um, about you don't understand what it is. 
I think about sort of the, you know, back in the, the turn of the 20th century with sort of social Darwinism, right, where you had sort of Dar Darwinism and evolution come along and sort of racist glommed onto it and said, oh, this is great because it provides a scientific way to talk about, you know, these racist beliefs exactly. that we have, you know, and they sort of yeah. used it to prop up that whole school of thought, you know, and it's, it's yeah, the, belt, the, the belt, same belt, thing happen, but with the black box of technology, right? That's right, and and people don't often think about um, when they're building a tool how the tool could be misused. I guess that's part of the role that we're supposed to take as people who think like bad guys for a living, who get paid to 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 think like uh, people who exploit systems for a living. It's our job to think about how a technology may be misused and make sure that it it's hard to misuse it. Right. Um, otherwise, right. you know, this technology, which can do great stuff, will be repurposed only to do bad stuff. Okay, we have two That's questions. That's part of why I'm working on this. Okay, two, two questions, one from Jake via text, and Martin, I see your hand raised. I'll get to you in one second. Um, so Jake's question is, can you talk more about uh, the, how the models save data and the risks around stored learned data? Oh, huge. It's just, it's huge. I mean, our view is that a lot of the risks that we've identified in our report have got to do directly with representation and how data are represented inside the model, how they're stored in the thresholds and weights of a neural system. Um, those are very, very tricky things. And we've only begun to scratch the surface of that work. We've been thinking about it for about a year now. And we haven't made enough progress to share our theories yet. Um, but, you know, beyond just kind of storing data in the normal way and trying to keep it confidential, now we have representation issues. Like if you come back later and you look at those thresholds and weights, what's it going to tell you? Um, and, and how do you know it's the same as it was before? And how do you know if it's somebody hasn't tampered with it in interesting ways? And in fact, one interesting thing to note is that a lot of people that are trying to understand these systems use a neurophysiology technique, which is not a very nice one, but it's called ablation, where you just destroy a little subsection of the neural system and you see what happens. <laughs> and, you know, I hate to say it, but we do that with monkeys and we do that with dogs and maybe we shouldn't, but we do. Uh, and so we're trying to understand how those systems work. and it, in the same way, some scientists working on ML are trying to understand how um, these systems work by ablation. Um, so all those issues of representation and storage and how we know what it's doing, they're all tied together in, in ways that are, that are tricky, but really fun to work at. And, you know, I've, I've had a really great time working on this stuff for just over a year. And it's just, I mean, applying... Our, our security mindset that all of you share with me to this machine learning technology is just really fun. And it's, it's so new. People are like, what? You, you think about that? And it's like, what? You don't think about that? <laughs> and that's where we are in the field today. Question from Martin. Martin, I see you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure how to verify if I'm being heard, but so I can it's going to seem like <clears throat> like a little bit of a wacko uh, observation that my, uh, and you can just comment on it if you'd like. It comes a little bit more from the notion of global norms uh, with respect to uh, cybersecurity and cyber war. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I was speaking with a Russian intelligence officer, uh, originally KGB, later foreign, uh, foreign intelligence. And somehow we got talking on the subject of open source. Mm -hmm. And she looks at me and says, the reason open source developed in the West is because you guys, like, like talking to me is representing all of the West. <laughs> you guys, you guys knew that if you didn't make it open source, we would just steal it. Uh -huh. uh, as, in other words, Russian intelligence would just might steal as well it. publish it, right? Yeah. Um, but so my question is that you know she said that rather matter of factly, and and in a way she really believes it, like mm -hmm. as in the way of saying when it comes to international cyber competitions, uh, 
you know, sort of espionage wars and all this, there's no constraints. That mm-hmm. the game is played like anybody can do anything. There aren't any rules. And right. uh, anyway, so you know, just sort of as a, if you want to kind of comment on that sort of global aspect of lack of norms or maybe you perceive norms, but you yeah. know that element of yeah. the impact on this. Yeah, one one obvious way is that you know norms in the West um, differ from norms in say the Middle East in in many obvious ways, um, and uh, when you build a machine learning system that learns um, according to the data set which came from the society that built the data set, um, it's going to mirror its its data. And so, you know, how we handle that in the West um, versus other cultures is an interesting thing. I haven't really given that much thought. Um, I'm, I'm actually thinking now more about, you know, the sort of super optimism of developers and engineers and high technologists who just build something because it's cool and they want to work in something because it's exciting and cool and new and they don't think about other people misusing their stuff on purpose. I mean, we have a sort of societal disconnect in our own North American culture. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to that are developers where I'd say, I can attack your code like that. And they would go, why would anybody ever do that? And you go, uh, people are bad. They're bad people. And they go, really? They're bad people. You go, have you heard of bank robbery? And they go, Oh yeah, people do rob banks, do not they? And uh, I mean, really quite literally, many people who build these systems in California land and other places don't um, think about the adversarial situations much. Um, And that leads us to build systems that are wildly optimistic in terms of their uh, ability to be manipulated. And we have to watch out for that. So I think that your insight Um, which comes from cross-cultural concerns, applies even at smaller levels in cross-national concerns, you know, in parts of our society where we have one politics versus another, our views of privacy versus not privacy, what's more important, the collective good or the good of the individual. All these things are tricky and machine learning will do what it can to shed light on those uh, issues and not, often not in a pretty way. So we're we're almost at the top of the hour. I had I had two two somewhat related questions to throw at you, and and then and then um, maybe we'll have time for one more question, or maybe we'll just break. Um, so the the first is um, it kind of picking up on what Martin asked um, about um, n- norms and standards internationally. Um, and I know you, both with vSIM and, and with this, your background is as a scientist, and so you kind of come at things from, as you call it, a, a science-y way. Um, yeah. Is there a way, um, is, is, so I guess like, the question is, is that the right approach to take with this, um, with machine learning, maybe something akin to what we do with um, you know, medical research, for example, of you know, clear uh, national, international authorities, uh, panels of experts, um, review, and, and the kind of process by which medical research becomes accepted and adopted. Is that kind of what you have in mind for this area as well? Because, of course, that's very different from the way <laughs> software has been developed over the last 50 years. I get it. I get it. Can, can I throw in a smart-ass comment? As long as we can work on stem cells, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the the dumb, the dopes that try to do policy might try to stop us from doing anything in AI, and that's just going to be dumb, and it won't work. So it really depends entirely on on how rational and reasonable constraints are or should be. And I'm not sure we all agree on all that stuff right now. Um, I'm not one of those people who's afraid of AI. Um, or, and it may be because I'm not all that optimistic about the human race. So what's next? Maybe it'll be better uh, in all seriousness. And I, you know, I've had big conversations about that for years and years because some people said to me, even in grad school, how can you even work on this stuff? And my answer is, how can you not? (laughs) So, 
Really good question. Now we're into philosophy, which was my first field. <laughs> so, so the second question I had for you is, as, as you're, you were saying that this is that the types of uh, threats that you've been talking about are really not in the playbook or even on the radar of your typical security operations professional. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, you're kind of talking about a new branch of what we would think of as information security um, mm -hmm. tailored to these types of threats. Um, so I guess maybe if you could do kind of a thumbnail sketch of what that new type of security professional uh, looks like and uh, what what you know what they need in their in their tool belt as it were to really take on these machine learning and AI based uh, threats. That's a toughie. I, uh, thanks for ending with such an easy question. Um, <laughs> the when I started working on software security I was faced with the same thing. So it was pretty clear to me that we needed software security, but the question is where do people come from that work on that? And the answer that I came up with was different than the answer that the world came up with. I said, we should start with software people and teach them something about security. And the world said, well, let's just start with network guys and try to teach them about software. I think my way works and the other way doesn't work. <laughs> so honestly, I mean, you end up with application security where there are people with like big reams of clipboards that don't even know what a compiler is and they run a tool and throw raw results at dev. That doesn't work at all. And so um, I think that we have to take a lesson from software security, which is if you want to do software security, you damn well better know how to code and say, if you want to do machine learning security, you better build some machine learning models and know your way around some statistics and understand machine learning more deeply um, than say a, your generic network engineer might. Uh, so, you know, my view is um, in a new field, it's often easier to start with the target um, than to, and securify them than to start with security people and target five them, so to speak. But that's just my own view. People don't always agree with me about that. Well, Gary McGraw of Berryville Institute of Machine Learning, thank you so much for uh, coming in and agreeing to uh, speak to us here at the Security of Things meetup. Yes, so next time I wanna do this in Boston and then we're gonna all go to drink and have a cocktail. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. We're gonna to go to drinks, nobody's gonna be wearing a mask. And, and you're uh, paying, right? <laughs> fucking A, I'm happy to pay, yes. Awesome, well thank you for your attention everybody. Um, please read the report and if you have feedback, I'd love to hear from you. And you've got the contact information right there in the screen, people. Um, and Duncan, yes, I will save the chat. Um, Duncan says it to everybody, remember to save the chat if you want it. Um, and Gary, thanks so much. We will have you in the flesh one of these days. My pleasure. Thanks for setting it up. Nice no to chat with you people. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.